Hey friends, and welcome back to the teaching and preaching ministry of Mohican Church of the Brethren. I'm Pastor Paul Bartholomew, and I'm thrilled to be able to have you join us today for worship on this last Sunday of 2020. If you're like a lot of people, you've been anxiously awaiting the end of this year. Uh, and so, uh, so we're going to take a look at that today. There is a, a pastor is always torn, at least I am. When we get to the Sunday right after Christmas, do you stick with the Christmas theme or acknowledge that, hey, it's the end of the year and, uh, and we, want to, uh, we want to give attention to that? Well, I opted this time to, uh, to actually take our focus a little bit away from Christmas, and, or maybe a lot, and to look instead at, um, at the year end and uh, just looking back in review, perhaps in a message that I've entitled, A More Proper Perspective. Uh, we're going to be actually in Job. Uh, yes, Job chapters 1 and 2 is where we're going to be spending our time this morning. And so if you have a Bible handy, you might want to turn there to Job. Uh, it comes in right before Psalms. Uh, and so if you, um, it's just if you were to open your Bible right in the middle, uh, look just a tad to the left, you'll find the book of Job. Well, anyhow, we're going to be, uh, we're going to be there in a moment. But first, let's pray. Almighty God, as we gather before you today, we do thank you, Lord, for the privilege that we have to come in your name. In the name of Jesus Christ, knowing that you hear us, uh, God, what a wonderful season this has been. Uh, Lord, the, uh, the, the brightness, uh, not of the lights, uh, although those are beautiful, and not of the gifts around the tree, although those do bring some, uh, some, uh, some smiles to faces and some happiness, no doubt. But God, we thank you for the beauty of the season and for the joy that we have found in Jesus the Christ. And so, Father, we just, we come to you now, we wait in expectation. God, I do thank you for the privilege of preaching the word. And I thank you, Father, for those who are gathering around it, either in person or, or um, at some uh, electronic device. Lord, being able to sit down, though, around your word together to study. And so, God, we just pray for your gracious presence uh, to be with us. We pray, Father, that you would quicken our hearts so that your living, active word could find ready soil in our hearts. Lord, teach us, we pray, as we look to you in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Oh, and Father, for those uh, for whom this has been such an incredibly difficult season, God, thank you for the comfort that you can bring to us through uh, this same Savior of whom we spoke, the same Savior whose birth we celebrate. Thank you for the incredible comfort and joy that we find in the Christ. Again, we pray all this in his matchless name. Amen. So taking a look back at 2020, I mean, was it a bad year? Um, I don't know. I don't know, was it a challenge? No doubt a challenge. Um, <clears throat> for many of us, uh, it seemed like the calendar pages that make up the year 2020 have been, uh, have been difficult. Uh, is it a year to remember? Oh, sure, not necessarily in all the, uh, all the right ways, all the positive ways, but no doubt a year to remember. Are you glad to see it over? Um, well, no question, uh, at least a lot of people, because we've We've gotten this notion that, uh, wow, 2020 is just bad. Um, I've kind of fallen into it too, so I don't want to be too critical of, of others who have seen this as, you know, it's like, wow, this is just tough. Well, hey, it's 2020. I know I've said that when, uh, when things have broken, when things have, uh, have fallen apart, uh, when the best laid plans have unraveled. Uh, I've said, hey, you know what, it's, it's 2020, so whatever. Shoot, when I saw the Browns winning, I'm like, hey, well, it's 2020, anything can happen, right? It's, it's been an odd year, uh, it's been an odd year, but, but has it been devoid of God's grace? No way, no way. And so we're going to take a look at a different perspective, perhaps a more proper perspective, as we look back on the year and, uh, and look forward with hope. 
Turn with me to Job chapter 1. In the land of Uz, there was a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and he shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the peoples of the East. His sons used to take turn holding feasts in their homes, uh, before COVID, no doubt. Uh, they used to take turns holding feasts in their homes. They would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when a period of feasting had run its course, Job would send and have them purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. Well, one day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord, from roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. And then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright. He is a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing, Satan replied? Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything that he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and his herds are spread throughout the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and surely he will curse you to, his face, to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has is in your hands, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. And then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and he said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby and the Sabaeans attacked and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword and I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the sky, burned up the sheep and the servants, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and he said that the Chaldeans formed three raiding parties. They swept down on your camels and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword. I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came, and he said, Your sons and your daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert. It struck the four corners of the house. The house collapsed on them, and they are dead. And I am the only one who escaped to tell you. At this, Job got up, and he tore his robe and he shaved his head and fell to the ground in worship and he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all of this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Well, on another day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them to present himself before him. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord, from roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. Skin for skin, Satan replied. A man will give all that he has for his own life, but stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and attacked Job with very painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. And then Job took a piece of broken pottery and he scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. And his wife said to him, are you still 
holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. And he replied, you're talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all of this, Job did not sin in what he said. May God add his blessing to this reading of his holy word. It might seem like a strange place um, for us to turn in the text right after Christmas, just a couple of days ago, we were celebrating the coming of the Christ child, and all of a sudden it's like, hey, let's turn to Job. But listen, friends, I know that the, the year 2020, I've heard so many people so challenged by the difficulties of it, whether it be the political um, the nightmare that has gone on uh, and all of the mess surrounding that, um, whether it has been COVID and everything that has surrounded that and, and the death and destruction that that has brought and the financial ruin that, that has been inflicted upon this nation and around the world. Maybe it's, been, um, maybe it's been the isolation itself that has caused great difficulty between family members. Uh, we, know that, we know that divorce rates are high right now. We know that suicide rates are high right now. We know that, uh, that uh, antidepressants and things like that, a lot of folks seeking medication, a lot of folks seeking help from counselors. Uh, and, and so all of those are indicators that this has been a tough, tough time. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. And it seems appropriate, though, that, that, that we, as, well, uh, as a Christ follower, I know that many of you who are tuned in, you're Christ followers also, and you so want to honor the Lord, and we don't want to get swept up in the the current culture that's just bemoaning everything and failing to see that God has been at work in the midst of this. And for some, it's taken a real toll on the faith. I was excited to run into somebody the other night who, who actually was here receiving groceries from our food pantry. And so life is difficult, but he said, you know what? He says, Pastor, I just want to tell you my faith is actually been growing through this whole thing. My faith has grown stronger. I pray that yours has as well. But in case you've lost focus, in case you've lost perspective, then, then join me as we unpack this a little bit. And so in the first couple of verses in Job chapter 1, we, we learn a few things uh, in the first few verses about Job. We understand that he was a very wealthy man from us. Um, he, 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, uh, a large number of servants, the greatest man among all the peoples of the East. And so he was a very wealthy man. He had everything that this world had to offer. Uh, very successful, obviously. The Lord had blessed him. Satan even acknowledged there in verses 10 and 11, or verse 10, that, hey, uh, you know what, you've had a hedge around him and his household, everything that he has. You've blessed the work of his hands. His flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. And so Job had known the goodness, the kindness of God. In the process, though, while the scriptures tell us that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into heaven... Uh, we know this about Job, that in the midst of all of that, Job was upright. He was blameless. That he had a heart for God, and, and we can even see that there in verse 5, when Job's regular custom was making sure that everything was right between him and God. Very attentive to his relationship with God, even to the point of, of make, you know, offering uh, sacrifices for his children in case they had sinned against God. So he feared God. He shunned evil. This is the kind of guy that he is. He has a dad to seven sons and three daughters. That's the introductory stuff in verses 1 through 5 in chapter 1. And, and then we come, verses 6 through 19, the day that the wheels fell off. 
Now I realize when we start actually in verses 6 through 12, we just find this really unsettling conversation uh, for sure between God and Satan. Uh, the angels came to present themselves before God. You remember that, uh, well, this is perhaps one of those passages that, that would have caused Erwin Lutzer from uh, Moody Memorial Church. Uh, he had pastored there for many, many years. But uh, but Erwin Lutzer, I remember hearing him say, even the devil is God's devil. Um, in other words, that Satan himself has to answer to God. He acts like he's a big deal, uh, and he is a big deal compared to human beings, but he is not a big deal compared to God. Uh, Satan, created by God, has uh, he is not the equal and opposite power. Uh, it's not a matter of good and evil. Well, it is a matter of good and evil, but we dare never think of God and Satan on the same plane. They are clearly not. God is exalted high above all, all right? And so, but even so, we have a, a, an unsettling conversation here when, when Satan uh, is, is having this conversation about God, and God's actually the one who brings up, have you considered Job? As unsettling as it is to see the conversation that goes on in verses 6 through 12, uh, to, to see that dialogue, and it's like, wow, I'm not sure that I'm completely okay with that. Well, uh, for one thing, God didn't ask for our permission uh, because he's God. He doesn't ask for our permission. But, but the one thing that, that I see in this is that it does give me a sense of relief to know that every trial that will ever face me has been sifted through my father's hand. Not my dad, but my heavenly father. Every trial I'm ever going to face, it's been sifted through his hand before it ever got here. I'm reminded of, of Luke 22 when Jesus spoke to Peter and said, Hey, Peter, listen, you got to understand, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. Satan has asked, and, and so there is, there is that image again uh, of Satan as, as tough as he looks, as, uh, as powerful as he is, compared to our own human strength, he's got to ask permission. Luke twenty two thirty one. 31, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen the brothers. And so Jesus acknowledges this, um, Jesus acknowledges this, uh, this authority that he has over Satan there in Luke 22. Same kind of thing that we see in verses 6 through 12 in Job 1, when Satan comes and, and has to get permission. The trials that fell on Job in verses 13 through 19, uh, unbelievable trials, those kind of things like make your head spin, cascading calamity is just hitting Job. And, and every bit of it was sifted through the hands of the Almighty God. While he was still speaking, and while he was still speaking, and while he was still speaking, it's hard to even imagine what that must have been like. The pain was indeed understandable. The grief was real. The sorrow, we look down at verse 20, and at this Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. And, and we're like, okay, I'm with you, I'm with you. It shows tearing the robe. It shows externally it's an attempt to show how the heart is torn in two and just breaking. It's that external uh, It's that external response to what's going on inside. He tore his robe, he shaved his head. Uh, no longer was it going to be this, this, symbol, this, uh, this symbol of strength. But he shaved his head and... and and, and then it says he fell to the ground in worship. Fell to the ground in worship. Uh, listen, I don't know how much of the year 2020, how much of the events of the year 2020 have caused you to fall down in worship. I have to think a little bit. 
I got to think back through. And, and listen, uh, my struggles in 2020 have been different than yours. Uh, some of them have we've been in the same kinds of things, but exactly how the difficulties have impacted each of us have been, been a little bit different. But none of us have escaped challenges in 2020, not a single one of us. But I don't know, friends, I'm just being honest with you. I don't know that I necessarily fell to the ground in worship in the midst of it, at least not my first reaction. Well, and, and, and in fairness, Job's first reaction was to tear his robe and shave his head in deep sorrow. But he fell down in worship. That word there is to see what God is worth and give him what he's worth. Sometimes uh, the word worship is actually, um, sometimes it's, it's called worth-ship, W-O-R-T-H, ship, because it has to do, it helps us understand that worship is indeed uh, seeing the worth of the one whom we adore, seeing the worth of the one, and as best we're able, then responding according to that worth. So it says in verse 20, he fell to the ground in worship. And then notice what he says in verse 21. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. Now, listen, I don't mean to make light of his sorrow. I can't even imagine what he has gone through, but, but, but it, it almost is a good reminder for us, hey, listen, before I drown in my wine, W-H-I-N-E, before I drown in my wine, I have to remember that I started without even the clothes on my back. I started without even the clothes on my back. Naked I came. Naked I came. And, and what do I have that he has not given me? What do I have that he has not given me? It, it has all come from him. Naked I came. He, when he paused, when he paused to acknowledge the worth of God, when he paused to to, to fall down in worship, to humble himself rightly before God. In the midst of all of that, real sorrow, intense difficulty, unimaginable pain, he humbled himself before God, threw himself on his face, and the acknowledgement that came from that was, listen, I came naked, I'm leaving naked. Everything that I have, even the clothes on my back, they've all come from him. That's an important perspective. We're going to talk more about that in just a little bit. But then he continued here in verse 21 when he said, listen, the Lord gave. The Lord gave, the Lord's taken away. And listen, as we understand lordship, is that not his prerogative? Is that not his right as sovereign Lord of the universe? Now, I understand some of you listening right now are having, uh, you're in the midst of a really dark trial, and, uh, and, and, and right now you might just want to smack me or, or turn the, the, uh, your TV off. Uh, stick with me for a moment, because we're just looking at the honesty of, of the word, and you could say, but pastor, you don't know what I'm going through. Uh, no, you're probably right. But in the same way, we can't even understand what Job was going through. And here is the man of God. We have this picture of a godly response to ungodly difficulty. I, ungodly. And God allowed it. Maybe that's a poor choice of words. But unimaginable pain. And we see a godly response when he says, hey, the Lord gave. The Lord's taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. May the name of the Lord be praised. That was, that was it? That's what he came up with? At the end of all this difficulty, that's what he came up with. Well, listen, naked I came. Naked I'm leaving. The Lord gave, the Lord's taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In my wealth, in my poverty, 
He is worthy. Period. In my strength, in my weakness, He is worthy. Period. In my life, in my death, He is worthy. Period. In my home that is filled with joy and is complete. In, in every good thing, he is worthy. But in my home that is broken, that is struggling, that is pain-filled, he is worthy. He is worthy. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Well, so we start in chapter 2. And we run into this equally unsettling section there in verses 1 through 6. Indeed, on another day, the angels came to present themselves to the Lord. Now, we don't know exactly the time frame between the first test and, and what's called Job's second test. We don't know that. But although this, too, is very unsettling, when God says to Satan, hey, he still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. Skin for skin, verse 4. Satan says, a man will give all that he has for his own life, but you stretch out your hand, you strike his flesh and bones, he will curse you to your face. Again, once again, finding comfort in knowing that, that Satan has to ask permission of the sovereign God before he does any, anything in the believer's life. And so we get down to verses 7 and 8. And, and what's going on? Well, God had put the parameters on. He says, you have to spare his life. And so Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Verse 7, afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. And, you know, uh, the, the best I can picture that is, um, you know, when the kids were little and they got chicken pox and some of them got real light cases, but some of them got real bad cases. And they were just itching everywhere. Maybe there, was, uh, maybe there was an allergic reaction that you witnessed in your own life or with your children. It's like, uh, yeah, from the soles of my feet to the top of my head. Well, it, Job had sores everywhere. So much so that he's sitting in the ashes. Well, they have had some curative power, some, some healing power, something to, 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 to dry up the, the, the oozing. Um, I don't know that. But he's sitting in the ashes. Again, it's a, it's a picture of his brokenness. It's a picture of his sorrow. He's looking as bad on the outside. He's trying to look as bad on the outside as he feels on the inside. He's sitting in ashes and scraping himself a piece, a chunk of broken pottery, just scraping, scraping. Can you imagine the misery? He's just miserable. It's hard to even imagine the pain and the frustration that has been added to the sorrows that, well, to borrow the line from, from an old hymn, the sorrows that like sea billows roll. He's unable to catch his breath from this last wave, and he sees his wife coming, and, and she's, she's coming out. He's looking forward to a word of encouragement from her sweet lips, and oh... Never mind. Look at verse 9. He's left with his wife. Now, listen, love my wife like crazy. It would be harder to, though, if she were a woman like this. Look at verse 9. Are you still holding on to your integrity? Why don't you just curse God and die? Well, she actually doesn't understand integrity very well because integrity is soundness of character through and through. No matter where you slice it, you're going to find the same thing. Well, you still holding on to your integrity? Just curse God and die. Man, so much for, hey, listen, honey, we've lost everything, but we're in this together. So much for that. She's like, just curse God. Get it over with already. Maybe God will do you a favor and put you out of your misery. Hey, listen, verse 9 does give us a word of caution. So for every couple uh, that's listening to this, or if you're part of a couple, uh, even if the, your other half isn't with you, then I just want to encourage you, pay attention. The word of caution in verse 9, and maybe, well, according to the divorce rates that are really, really high right now, 
A lot of people have experienced this. Hardship comes, difficulty comes in life, and it's like, well, listen, um, this is something I can't fix right here, this relationship. This is just adding more stress to my life, so maybe if I just get out of this relationship. Um, relationships are especially vulnerable in times of great stress. Especially vulnerable. I mean, you see, she comes in, hey, curse God and die. He's like, oh, you're talking like a fool. Not exactly, you know, sweet times. Um, not exactly hearing birds singing right now, unless they're the vultures that, uh, well, they don't sing, but unless it's the vultures that are beginning to circle of a relationship that's on its way out. Relationships are especially vulnerable in difficult times. So listen, friends, be vigilant. Be vigilant. Your enemy, the devil, roams around like a roaring lion seeking those that he may devour. And he hates the Christian marriage because it's a picture of the church in miniature. And so he already hates your home. He doesn't need another reason to. Be vigilant. Be prayerful. Meet together with your spouse at the throne of grace. And allow God to use this event to draw you actually closer to one another, but closer still to him. Just a word of caution out of verse 9. Verse 10, then we have this really great question. Here it is. So, should we accept good from God and not trouble? And friend, when I look at this, and I look at verse 21, I'm, I'm just challenged with this perspective that Job has that I think we could learn from. So we look back on 2020. Hey, listen, I came with nothing. I came naked. I'm leaving naked. God's name is to be praised. The Lord gave. The Lord's taken away. God's name is to be praised. Hey, should we accept good from God and not trouble? That's one of those soul-searching questions, right? It's one of those things that, that truly drives us to our knees when when we look at the goodness of God in our lives and all that we can come up with is, as wow, 2020 has been a hard year. Wow, it's been a difficult time. I mean, there's, man, there's, there, there's trouble and famine and, and all these things all around us. 2020 is just awful. Let's get it behind us. And I submit to you, it's like, wait a minute. God is worthy of our praise. And so I want to close today uh, with a uh, turnover uh, a handful of pages into verse, verse Psalm 27. Psalm 27, it goes like this. Because as 2020 draws to a close, I believe we need to fix our focus. We need to draw our attention not on what has been taken away, but on what the Lord has done. We get so caught up in a culture, the culture that does not know God is focused on everything that 2020 has stripped away. And some of us have gotten swept up in that. So as 2020 draws to a close, just want to challenge you, focus not on what has been stripped away, but on what God has done, recalling the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living and looking forward with hope. Here's Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. And though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Listen, for in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon a rock. And then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me, at his tabernacle will I sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, O Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Can I just pause for a moment? There's a huge difference between seeking God's face and seeking his hand. 
Think about that. My heart says of you, Psalm 27, verse 8, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me, nor turn your servant away in anger, for you have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, O God, my Savior. Though my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, breathing out violence. The trouble's not over, is it? But listen, here's how he ends, verse 13. But I'm still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Friend, will you and I, will we see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living? I'm confident that we will if that's what we're looking for, even in 2020. And so wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Amen. Join me as we close in prayer, would you? Father God, I do thank you, Lord, for this challenge that we have in your word. God, when we look at a godly response to great difficulty, it, well, at least I find that I'm lacking. Help us, God, to honor you with our hearts, our minds, to, to not just pretend that the grief is not there, to not pretend that the sorrows aren't real, because they are, and we see that clearly. But God, in the midst of it all, to fall down and worship, for great is your name and you're greatly to be praised. Father, fill your people's hope, hearts with hope as we wait before you, as we look to you, as we seek your face. Fill our hearts with hope, we pray to know that we too can see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. As we are strong and have good courage, as we take heart and wait for the Lord. So help us, God, we pray. We love you, Father. We don't always show it in the way that we act, in the way that we live. Thank you for your amazing mercy and grace. Help us, Father, to change our focus and to glorify your great name. We pray in Christ. Amen. Well, hey, listen, friends, thank you. I do so appreciate you tuning in today. Uh, may God's rich blessing be upon you and yours. And hey, if I haven't told you lately, I just, I love you like crazy. All right, thank you. <laughs>